<clears throat> excuse me, are more devotionals. And so if you've been involved with us, we've had a 21-day fast, and this is our last week. And uh, the devotional is called More, and it was written by several different people uh, in the church. There's a different daily devotional uh, that's kind of going along with the subjects that we teach uh, throughout the week and on Sundays. And so it's been really, really fun and exciting. My family, if you don't know, has decided to do a media fast, and so we've been uh, not watching TV and, and videos and things like that, which has really kind of been tough for me during the NFL playoffs. Can I get an amen on that? Uh, it's a little tough, but we also realized that in our family, this was one of the things that was pulling us away from our relationship with God. And how do we realize that? We had that conversation. We sat down with the kids and said, hey guys, what's distracting you from your relationship with God? And this is what we came up with. And so we've been doing that, and we've been following through the devotionals. So every night we get up and we do our devotional uh, together, not get up. Uh, we were up in the morning. Uh, at night, we're going to bed, and we do our devotional before bed, and we pray together uh, as a family. And so one of the devotionals, I believe it was Monday, it might have been Tuesday, Buff wrote, and she had us read Galatians 6. And as we read Galatians 6 as a family, we really discussed it uh, together. And so a lot of those things uh, we're going to come up with and talk about today, the things that we discussed uh, as a family. And so We've been doing a series called This Is Us, and it's all about who we are as disciples of Jesus. What is our responsibilities? What, what is our life kind of supposed to look like? And, and what does it involve as a disciple of Jesus? And so we've really knocked it down to these four things. Uh, of course, it's way bigger than this, but this is what we can do. And so reaching the lost, and we talked about that the first week and how we are responsible to go into all the world which is what uh, Sean talked about. And we go into our world, and that's where it starts. And the, the Bible tells us that we will be witnesses in Judea first, then in Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth, which is like, basically, in, in relative to that, would be like defiance, and then Ohio, and then all over the place. And so we have that responsibility. Then we engage in community. And that's what we talked about last week, that you will never be all that you were called to be on your own. And we all know that to be true. And there's many sayings out there, behind every great man is a, is a great woman, behind, you know, a great organization is, is, is great uh, leaders, and so there's so many people involved in making us successful, and so we really want you to engage with other believers, and this week we're talking about building up believers. Now one of the popular themes, or the main themes of this, is we've talked about your responsibility behind that. As a wrestling coach, I tell my kids all the time, you will get, get out what you put in. And if you want to be really good at this sport, then you have to invest. You have to invest time. You have to invest effort. It's going to be really, really, really tough on you. But if you will do it, you will be successful. And I don't know how many kids that I could, I could name that start off really, really good and kids that start off not so good. And by the time they're, they're juniors and seniors, that has totally shifted. Because one kid is willing to work hard and the other one is not. And so it's not always about natural ability. Now, natural ability comes into play, and that's super cool, and that ticks the rest of us off that you have that natural ability, but it, it, it doesn't always come into play. Work and effort really make a difference. And I think that even comes into play more when we're talking about building up believers, when we're talking about a spiritual workout, an exercise program, being strong in the faith. Like so much of that sits on your own personal responsible shoulders. It's on you. And, and, and if you want to be a spiritual giant, then you have to work out. You have to exercise. You have to put disciplines, and, and that tends to be a foul word, word, word in our culture, but you have to put disciplines in your life to make that happen. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Father, we thank you for this time that we get to gather and grow in you. And Lord, I ask that whatever word is spoken, Lord, that it would be directly from you. And that it would pierce our hearts. And Lord, you know what we need. Father, I pray that every person in this room leaves changed by your spirit. And that you would infiltrate their hearts. Lord, that you would touch their minds. And that every part of them would be different. Because of your words that we get to read today. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to talk about spiritual growth today. And our responsibility when it comes to spiritual growth. And we're going to talk about maybe a, a spiritual workout and what it looks like and what we know about working out. But one of the things that Steve said that uh, Scott read for us in his prophecy is he talked about skill, patience, time, and willingness. Those are all things that it takes for us to be good at something, doesn't it? And you know what's cool about this? 
God gave every person in this room the skills or the equipment or what it takes to be spiritually strong. You have it. It's not like it's some crazy thing out there that, that nobody can reach except for a few people. No, you, you have what it takes to be strong in the Lord. If, if you didn't, the Bible wouldn't instruct us that way, would it? It wouldn't tell us to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might if you didn't have what it takes. You do have what it takes. But what were the other things? Patience, time, willingness. You know, you can go to the gym today and work out hard, and it would not get you very far if that's the only time you worked out. It would get you super duper sore, might even hurt you, wouldn't it? But it wouldn't be very effective. Or you could go the opposite. You could go every single day to the gym, and you could sit there with your headphones on. Mm -hmm. And then one day be like, I don't know why this isn't working. And we'd be like, uh, because you're not doing anything. Because you can go there and not do anything. Isn't that true? And it doesn't work. So you have to have this effort that goes in, and you have to do it over a period of time for it to make a difference and actually work. You know your, your walk with God is the same way, right? Relationships kind of work the same way. And so that's what we want to do. We want to get skill, and I wrote that on my hand, because when Steve said it, I was writing it on my hand. I didn't have anything else to write with. I wrote skill, patience, time, and willingness. Because that's what it takes to be successful. And so what do we know about workouts? We know this, that workouts prepare us for life, but they don't really look, at, look anything like life, do they? Do they? And we know that, and that's kind of the way it is. I love my quiet times in the morning. But my quiet time prepares me for life, but it's nothing like life. Life is throwing all kinds of things at me, and it's not quiet by any stretch of the imagination, right? I don't know if your life is quiet. My life is not quiet by any stretch of the imagination. We have all kinds of noise and crazy things going on. Uh, my wife decided last year to get us a puppy. I was like, yeah, because five kids isn't chaos enough. Let's get a puppy. So we have a puppy. We were told that this puppy would be about 50 pounds. It's 80 pounds. We have an 80-pound puppy. Do you know what that's like? Awesome is what it is. We love Crosby and he's something else, but he's, he's, he's just crazy and intense. And our life can be like that. But we have these quiet times in the morning, and yes, they don't look anything like life, but they prepare us for life. I used to work out all the time. And I'd sit on that bench press, and I would lift weights, right? And I didn't do that because maybe one day, uh, you know, 300-pound barbell would fall on my chest, and I'd have to lift it off, and I'd be like, I'm preparing for the future. I didn't do that. It's so funny, too. There was a trend of happening of cross-training, and I'm going to pick on somebody here, and I hope you don't get offended, but there was this popular thing like, hey, we don't do weights. We cross-train because weights are nothing like real life. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, because I might stumble upon an 800-pound tractor tire and be like, yeah, I should probably flip that. I should probably make sure that that gets out of the way of people. And since I've been doing cross-training and flipping, you know, these giant tractor tires, I'm able to do that. Or this big box that I need to jump on. I'm going to stumble upon that sometime uh, in my life. It's just interesting, right? And, and we, don't do, we, we know that, though. We know that it doesn't look like life, but it helps prepare us for life. We learn principles and things uh, through that. We also know that we rarely feel like doing it but are almost 100% glad that we do, right? We never feel like doing it, but we're, we're most of the time glad that we do. And this is where accountability comes in is, is super important at times. I actually had one of my kids this week. We're walking up to the track. The new gym at the school has a track above it that we get to run. And on our way up there, he announces, Coach, I'm not running today. I don't feel like it. And I'm like, well, I'm glad that I'm here then to make you feel like it. Woohoo! Because guess who is running today? And then, you know, he got to run a couple extra laps afterwards because he announced to the whole team that he wasn't planning on. So we're like, yay, workout, yay, exercise. So, you know, we don't feel like it at times, do we? That's just a, that's just a truth. I'm speaking truth here. We don't feel like it. It is hard. It is still hard. I've gotten up in the mornings for 20 years to do my quiet times, and I still fight myself every single day. And it's a battle. But one of the things that I want to make sure that people know about the Tracys, my family, my wife, my kids, is we are not afraid to do the hard things if they're the right things. That hard does not mean wrong. And that right and hard oftentimes go together. And if we're going to do the right things, that means we're going to do the hard things. 
And we aren't going to be afraid of the hard things. Just because it's difficult does not mean we're not going to do it. We're going to get it done. We're going to do the hard things. And so that's kind of our philosophy. And if we don't feel like doing it, sometimes, all the time, we still do it. And most of the time, we're glad that we did. Workouts are often short but intense. You know, and that's the truth. Like, you can't work out 24 hours a day, seven days a week, can you, physically? Because you don't have time and there's a lot of stuff going on. But you work out for 40 minutes, you work out hard. Our practices are an hour and a half for the wrestling team. We don't need more than that if we will practice hard. And so workouts are short but intense. Your life has a lot to it. You don't need a ton of time. But what you do need is some time. And take that time, and it might be short, but let it be intense in your walk with God. Good, solid workout. And another thing is recovery time. One of my favorite times of the day is when I lay my head down at night. I tell you, my mom got me stuck on this, which is just, and I don't want to say stuck because that sounds negative because it's fantastic. When I was a kid, I used to be afraid at night. And my mom would tell me, when you lay your head down, start quoting these scriptures. And so there are certain scriptures that I would say every single night as I would lay my head down to try and not be afraid so that I could go to sleep. And I've kind of built that habit in because it started when I was like six years old. And now I lay my head down and I pray and I decompress and I go through the day and I quote scripture. And it's just a powerful time of just recovery and relaxation. And I think it's probably one of the reasons why I fall asleep so easy. My wife gets angry because of how easy I fall asleep. I do struggle staying asleep, but I do fall asleep usually really, really easy. And I think it's because that habit that I have created or that my mom has really put inside of me. And so it requires recovery time. And when we're talking about discipline, we're talking about workouts, uh, those types of things, when we're talking about our spiritual walk with God, I want to define that for you. I've defined it as this, doing something you should do even if you don't feel like it and making sure you don't do something you shouldn't do when you do feel like it. That's the definition of discipline, isn't it? Doing something you know you should do even when you don't feel like it and making sure you don't do something you know you shouldn't do even when you do feel like it. You know, it's funny, I got to go and listen to Nick Saban do a a speech who is the um, coach of the national champion Alabama Crimson Tide again, which is just disappointing. Who cheered? St- stone them! Stone them! It's scriptural! I could show you in the bo- No, I'm just kidding. Anyways, um, I, I, we had this. We, had, we, we were able to go and listen to him share. And he said this trait right here is the trait he looks for in all of his players. It's the one thing he looks for. Do they have the ability to do what they don't feel like doing? And do they have the ability to resist the things they do feel like doing that they know is wrong? And I'm like, that's super good right there. If that's what we're looking for, we can be successful in that if we can implement that into our lives. And so that's really what discipline looks like. So let's go through Galatians 6. And we're going to read this together. And there's so many great points here in Galatians 6. But there's one a big one that I really, really want to point out in this. And the reason that I wanted to bring Galatians 6 is because it was part of our reading, and hopefully you did that, but also because there were so many questions that me and the kids discussed and talked about as we got into this. And so we're going to read verses 1 through 10, and I'm going to pull some of these points out and talk about these different sections here right now. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. Be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. All right, I want to stop right here. We didn't, we didn't get past verse 1, guys. This is so good right here. It, it, it kind of helps us to understand that we are responsible for each other, right? That we're in this together. And this goes back to what we talked about last week, engaging in community and how valuable accountability is in our lives. And one of the things that I think is, not one of the things, the thing that I think is the most undersold part of a wedding ceremony is, <coughs> excuse me, is the challenges of the witnesses. Because, I mean, the whole idea behind that is, listen, that I'm challenging you at this point that these two people have committed, and you're standing up here, best man, maid of honor, groomsmen, bridesmaids, saying that you stand with them in this marriage. And what we're saying to you is this, they made these vows, and you are now responsible to hold them to that. 
When I ask you to be my best man, I'm saying, listen, I'm committing to this woman, and I'm, and I'm asking you to hold me accountable for the vows that I make to her. And we don't take that very seriously, do we? But it is a serious, serious thing. That we should be standing up there as a part of the wedding ceremony knowing that this position that we have comes with responsibility. That I'm going to stand with you to push you towards your spouse and not away from them. And that can be hard for some people because we don't want to push them that direction, but we need to. I remember my parents, man, after we got married, they basically gave us all the same speech. Listen, we love you, we care about you, you're married now, you're no longer welcome at our house. (laughs) That was the gentle version. No, they were serious. They were like, listen, guys, you could come here. We will comfort you, but we will always send you back. Always. Because you got to work it out with your spouse because you committed to that person. And, yeah, I didn't say amen um, when they said that. But it's true. I mean, I amen it now. And I, I'm hoping to have the same speech for my kids um, as, as they do it as well. So we're supposed to gently and humbly help people back. And I think that gently and humbly is, is very, very important. And we have to ask ourselves that question. Am I gentle? Am I humble? Am I approaching this in pride? Or am I stepping back and saying, listen, I, I just want to do what's right by you. I want to help this situation as best as I can. And then it goes into this. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. So yeah, we're supposed to help each other. But we are responsible to make sure that we don't struggle ourselves. To make sure that we don't fall into this temptation. And that requires boundaries, doesn't it? We have to build up boundaries in our life. Boundaries are not a bad thing, people. They're not. We have to have boundaries. Love has boundaries. It's not real love without it. It's not. You don't just get to run over me. That's called slavery. There's boundaries in this relationship. And there's we stop abuse. So I have, and I always use this illustration in the youth group. I'd have a group of kids, and I'd have them standing on chairs. And I'd have one kid come up, and I'd say, okay, your job is to pull those guys off that chair, and you guys' job is to make sure that you don't get pulled off. And they would always pull them off. It wasn't that hard. They would get them off the chairs. Then I'd have like three or four kids, and I'd say, okay, you four, your job is to get that guy on a chair. And you, you don't want to go on the chair. And they could never get him up. They couldn't. They could never get the guy up on a chair. Why? Because it's easier to be pulled down than it is to lift somebody up. It just always is. And that was the challenge that I would give to them. We have to constantly be careful, be aware, build up appropriate boundaries, understanding that temptation is real and that we could get sucked into the same struggles, issues, problems. One of the things that I realized early on in my ministry, because I saw it with my own eyes, I saw a group of people getting together and they had a small group and they started complaining about their, one started complaining about their spouse and then another and then another and it became this big group of just complaining together and they slowly worked their way through where every one of them divorced. (laughs) I was like, oh good Lord, what is going on here? Because it's just true, right? It can be so easy where if you're not gently and humbly restoring that you can be gently and humbly pulled down. Isn't that true? And so he gives us this warning. Be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Verse 2, share each other's burdens, and this, in this way, obey the law of Christ. And so we're supposed to take on other people's loads when they're struggling and they have those issues. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. That might be the most important scripture right there in the Bible. For us to understand, you are not that important. I mean, seriously, one of the greatest things, one of the greatest aha moments or wake-up times that we can give to our kids is helping them to understand that the world does not revolve around them, right? And as we grow up as adults, hopefully we understand that, that this is God's story, and I'm a very small part of it, and I just need to do what God has asked me to do in my part. Verse 4, and this is where it gets... A little interesting. Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get satisfaction of a job well done. And you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. This is interesting, right? He tells us early on, and this was one of the things that we talked about 
with our kids and the kids brought up. They tells us to bear one another's burdens, but it also tells us that we are responsible for our own conduct. And that helps us to not blame others, doesn't it? I think the easiest thing for us to do with our lives is when something goes wrong, is to point the finger at other people. And when we see that, we need to be aware that this is not okay. We are responsible. What does that mean? We are able to respond in an appropriate or inappropriate way. That's what it means. I am responsible for my life and how it looks and how it turns out. And that's a really, really tough thing to do, but it is a reality. So yes, we bear one another's burdens, but we also own it. This is who I am. I have to protect myself from falling into temptation because I am responsible for my own conduct. And I'm telling you, I have kids all the time and wrestlers that deal with this stuff. In fact, I had one a couple, couple weeks ago, and I'm going to tell on, on one of my kids a little bit. But um, this was a tough situation. The principal came to me and, and uh, actually came to, to the other coach, and he said that this young man uh, was handed a homework paper, and he crumbled it up, and he threw it at the teacher. This was one of my wrestlers. And uh, she handed him another one, and he tore that up and then gave it to the teacher. And so, of course, he was like, I want you to know he'll not be at practice tomorrow. He's got detention. And, and he goes, and I would appreciate if you would help him understand that that's not how wrestlers act, defiance wrestlers, yada, yada, yada. I thought there would be a lot more shock moments in this. Guys, this was shocking to me. I'm like, he did what to a teacher? And he was like, yeah, you know, this is what happened. So we pull the kid over, and we're like, hey, we heard, you know, that this happened. Why in the world would you do that? He said, well, I tore the paper because I thought she would have learned the first time when I threw the first one at her. That's, that came out of his mouth. That came out of his mouth. He said, I thought she would have learned the first time. And I was like, I would have thought you would have learned the first. I don't even know what to say here. You know, it was just one of those moments of just total shock. And I'm telling you what, guys, anytime you think, I, I get to spend a lot of time at the school right now, and anytime you're thinking about criticizing a teacher or a principal, please second guess that because you have no idea the crap that they have to go through during the day. It is tough. I have been standing there when one of them was asking a kid to sign in and he was just simply refusing. No, I'm not doing that. No, listen, you, all you have to do is go sign. You're not in trouble. Just go sign. I'm not doing that. And you're like, ah, what is going on here? You know? And Big man, little kid, refusing, and it's just tough. It's tough. It's very hard. So anyways, he did that, and then he proceeded to tell us how the teacher, and I'm like, no, no, no. I mean, I wouldn't like you either. Like, if you're throwing papers at me, Tara, like, uh, this is not the teacher's fault that you are in trouble right now. It's not. But that's how we live life, isn't it? Somebody else's fault that I'm in trouble. No, 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 no. Let's not go there. We are, according to this, responsible for our own conduct. We are responsible. You are responsible. I am responsible. Listen, if you want to be a strong person in the faith, you can be. You are responsible. You can point fingers all day long, but when you stand before Jesus... He is not going to be like, oh, yeah, you're right, that teacher, mm, she was not very nice. No, no, no. Your actions, your life, you are responsible for your conduct. That's huge. Those who are taught the word of God should provide for the teachers, sharing all good things with them. I love that part of the scripture. Because we have so many mentors in our lives. I have them in my life. People that have really, really been gracious and ministered to me. And I have to remember them because it can be easy to brush them off. But remember those mentors that you have in your life and share good things with them. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we do not give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those of the faith. 
You see, sowing and reaping, it's one of those principles that you see over and over and over in Scripture. And it's something that we need to understand. But there's some part of this Scripture that is just so awesome that I've never seen before, and it has been something that I have just meditated on for probably a year now. And it's a part right here. It says, but those who live by the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit, verse 9. So let's not get tired of doing good, for we will reap a harvest, verse 10. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity. And, and, and when I saw that word opportunity, I instantly circled it in my Bible, and I keep coming back to it over and over and over and over again. Because I instantly saw sowing and reaping different. All growing up, I have heard, you will reap what you sow. And that was a negative thing. It was, you're being a bad boy right now, and you're going to reap what you sow. And I, and I never saw sowing and reaping as an opportunity. But you realize that that's what the Bible says right here. Whenever we have opportunity, we should do good to everyone. Like, you have an opportunity to sow positive things and therefore reap an amazing harvest and that's what that discipline and that spiritual workout really brings us isn't it it's an opportunity daily to sow really really good seed in your own life and you might not feel like doing it and it might not be easy but when you're when you're done you'll be glad that you did and the bible promises a harvest if we do not give up. That's what it promises us. That is so powerful and so good and, and so rich that I hope we can understand it and grab a hold of it. So I have this down that I wrote, and it's things every believer should be doing. And I think this is stuff that we should be doing weekly. This is stuff that we should do every single week, and it should be, as a believer, non-compromising. And I'm telling you, this list was super hard to make because it started out with like 38 things. It really did because it's like, I mean, if you, we go through Scripture and Scripture kept coming to mind over and over and over again. But I narrowed it down. I narrowed it down to a solid one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 39 to 8, guys. That's pretty good. Come on, help me out there. All right? But what should we be doing? We should be doing these daily and we should be doing them weekly. And the first thing is prayer. Prayer should be a real part of our lives as believers. It helps us to connect and commune with the Father so that we can be maybe prepared for some of the things that are coming. It will help us to build our faith. And once again, I've said this before, workouts don't often look like real life, but they prepare us for something. They prepare us for real life. And so prayer is one of those things that is a huge part of our preparation. It should be a big part of every believer's life. You should have time set aside to pray. Reading your Bible is another thing that is very, very important. Read your Bible on a daily basis. That's what every believer should be doing. Don't leave the teaching of the Word up to other people. Read it and study it yourself. Because if you know what it says, it is so much easier to not be deceived. So much easier. Another thing, small groups or accountability groups. We should have accountability in our lives. You should have people that are pushing you towards the gospel and towards faith. You should have it almost every day. I have accountability in my life. Why? Because I don't trust myself to do the right thing. And so I run things by people all the time. And when people make suggestions, even ones that feel mean, I oftentimes will take that to certain people that I trust and say, hey, is there truth behind this? And I listen to them. Why? Because accountability. Now, I don't do it 100% of the time right, of course. But I try very hard. And that's the important thing about having family is being accountable. Go to church. Every believer should go to church and make it a habit of doing so. Why? Because you get to see Scripture from different perspectives. You also get to worship together and commune with one another. That's not me being selfish because I pastor a church. That's just me telling you the truth that the Bible tells us to not neglect in Hebrews 10.25. Don't neglect coming together. Don't do it as some are in the habit of doing. But push one another on in love and good works. That's what it tells us to do. Don't neglect that. Make sure you do it. Tithing is another thing. We need to be giving. Of course, we read that scripture that said share with those 
who have been helping you. But give, tithing, every person. Why? Why is tithing important? One, it helps God to see or it helps you to see that that money doesn't have your heart. And so then you give. You give because there's, there's, there's something to that. But also, I'm telling you, it helps you learn to control your, your money yourself. Rejoice. Do you know the Bible tells us to rejoice always? Some of us need to rejoice a little more. That our day should be filled with joy. No matter the circumstances that are going on around you, you realize that you have a hope and a future, right? So, like Sean said a couple weeks ago, if you know that you have a hope and a future, you need to tell your face that. Right? Tell your face that you have a hope and a future. Because we should be the most joyous people on the planet. We should forgive every day. There should be no grudges in the body of Christ. We should forgive because we were forgiven. And then we need to be thankful. Every day, be thankful. One of the things that we have implemented at our house in the morning at the breakfast table is we go around the table and we say what we're thankful for. I did that a lot. We implemented that a lot for myself because at one point things were just negative and my mind got on the negative. And so I wanted to hear the good. Guys, what's going on that's great in our home? And so we started to share and it really changes things when you're grateful and have a heart of gratitude. Now, this stuff is not easy. It's not. We did our uh, devotional last night, and out of five kids, how many of them do you think were excited that we were doing our devotional? We've done it for 14 days. How many people were excited that we did our devotional? One, because she was the one that got to read it. She was the only one that was excited about doing the devotional. It was her turn. But we did it anyways. Why? Because we do the hard things. We want to be known as people who do the hard things. Right things, hard things often go together, and we do the hard things. We're not going to run away from it because it's difficult. In fact, the greater the challenge, I'm hoping that my kids and, and my wife and us as the Tracy family, the stronger we rise up with the greater the challenge because we have such a wonderful hope and a future to look forward to. Father, we are excited about what you're doing in our hearts and lives. Lord, I pray that this word would just continue to be sealed in our hearts and that we would see your truth always as we walk through the day. Lord, help us to spend our time in spiritual workout, knowing that it will help us get through our everyday lives. Lord, that we are responsible for our life and our actions and that we wanna build ourselves up as strong believers, strong people of the faith. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, this is Sharon. Sharon is a big part of putting all of our small groups uh, together, which as you know we're doing right now, and that's the, the tables that are set up in the back. So uh, there was a suggestion on Tuesday uh, for somebody else to share about our small groups uh, and their passion about it, and Sharon was volunteered. Now normally Sharon is kind of uh, anti going on the stage, but she was, she was I don't want to say joyous, but she was like, I'll do that, uh, share, because she's passionate about this. And so uh, that excites me. So she's going to share a little bit about her and small groups. So go ahead and, and listen. Go ahead and share, Sharon. And again, my name is Sharon. Um, just quickly, a little bit about me. If I haven't met you yet, I am the secretary of the church. Usually you can find me out in the foyer. So if you have a question, feel free to ask. I'd love to help. Um, I have a wonderful husband. His name is Chad. We have three kids, a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one-year-old. So life is fun and life is full. <laughs> um, but I do want to talk to you about small groups. Um, I'm speaking to you that have not signed up for small groups yet. My husband and I, we have taught um, a class for close to a decade. And um, there's great benefits from attending a class. You learn lots of things, um, and that's wonderful. But the biggest, I think, is just meeting other people from the church. We've met so many people, so many of you, from um, just teaching the class, and I just cherish those relationships so much. So um, basically, we're a community. We're a family. We want you. We need you. We want to get to know you, and we want to spend time with you. So if you would please pull out of your bulletin, the connecting group flyer. I'm going to quickly just go through um, each of our groups we are offering this winter splash spring. Um, and if you want to turn around for me, I'm going to go from left to right. 
We have board game night, board games and snacks come for some great winter fun. We have yoga. You have the opportunity to exercise at no cost. The Nine Things, um, I've read this book myself and it's super good by Henry Cloud. The Way of the Warrior, men come to learn and share life together. Single moms um, come to share struggles and to get encouragement. The 300, men come to pray together, study and discuss. Um, financial Peace University, that's the one that my husband and I teach. Learn the seven steps to experiencing true financial peace. Smart Step Families, if you're remarried or considering remarriage, this video-based class is for you. What does the word say? Learn the most important doctrines in the Bible and how to apply them to your life. Survival Kit, learn foundations to the Christian faith. Building a Christ-centered self-esteem, learn how to let God restore your self-image. And lastly, how in the world, learn how to witness to others. So today, instead of going straight out those doors, I want you to go straight back to the tables, um, talk to the teachers, sign up for a class if you haven't already, and thank you very much. Yeah. So, <clears throat> from the stage, I often say, you know, hey, if you want to talk to or get filled out or sign up for something, talk to Sharon or Buff. That's Sharon, so you know who she is from now on. And understand that we are passionate about getting connected together as believers because we believe it's a big part of our discipleship. And so we encourage you to find a group of people or a class to really um, uh, get you lined up for some of those things. And a lot of those things like I taught about today about how to build those disciplines and things like that in your life, that goes right along with Mark Beringer's class. So we have a whole bunch of those lined up. And so you can really work on things that you know you need to work on to help connect with other believers and, of course, to be personally discipled yourself. So I encourage you, meet teachers, talk to them, sign up for classes, get connected if you're not. If you're involved in a small group, awesome. If not, please uh, do so. It is for your benefit. Father, we thank you for this day. We praise you for who you are. Uh, we trust you with our heart and our lives. Lord, we want to do the things that you say in the word because we know that you know us better than we do and you love us more than we can imagine. We praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, God bless you. You can all stand. We're dismissed. Have a wonderful Sunday.